The Statue of Liberty is the most famous sculpture in the history of America. But how did it actually get there? Who created it? And who paid for it? America's most famous icon didn't have an easy time coming into existence. In fact, it almost didn't get made at all. In this episode of Intrigued Mind, we'll be taking a look at the origin of the Statue of Liberty. It doesn't get much more American than the Statue of Liberty, but how much do you really know about its history? The Statue of Liberty is one of the most iconic symbols of America. Located in New York Harbor, it stands at 305 feet, 6 inches tall. It's famous throughout the world, but the Statue of Liberty had a strange and unexpected journey to icon status. In fact, it almost didn't get built at all. Before we get into this intriguing history, if you're interested in early access to videos and live chats with the creator of Intrigued Mind, consider subscribing to our Patreon. Your support will greatly help us keep the channel producing more intriguing content. The Statue of Liberty was originally thought of by a French sculptor named Frédéric Auguste Bartholdi. Before he started working on the project, he had never even been to the United States. The first sculpture he did that got him real recognition was for the Paris Salon Group and was based on the story of the Good Samaritan. After that, his hometown of Colmar commissioned him to create a bronze memorial statue for John Rapp, who was a general under Napoleon. Bartholdi then became interested in making colossal statues like the Statue of Liberty after traveling to Yemen and Egypt in 1855. Bartholdi's sculpting career was put on hold for a while when he served in the Franco-Prussian War of 1870 as a squadron leader of the National Guard. Many of the sculptures he would create after the war were inspired by his experiences as an officer. He created the Lion of Belfort, a massive sandstone statue of a lion to celebrate French heroism. His design for the Statue of Liberty was borrowed from an earlier idea he had while in Egypt. He had proposed a colossal statue that would stand at the entrance of the Suez Canal. It would be a woman holding a lantern in one hand and a tablet in the other. Sound familiar? It was going to be called Progress Carrying the Light to Asia. Egypt wasn't interested, mostly because it would have cost a huge amount of money. So, he turned his attention to America instead. Bartholdi originally wanted the Statue of Liberty to be in Central Park, but later decided it would be better in New York Harbor, specifically Bedloe's Island, and he renamed the Egyptian sculpture Liberty Enlightening the World. Bartholdi traveled across the United States, promoting his idea. Literally, he went from New York all the way to Los Angeles, trying to get people interested in the idea of building a giant statue that would represent the philosophical notion of liberty ingrained in the American story. Nobody was really interested at the time. He couldn't convince the American government to give him any money for this huge, expensive art project. He returned to France and continued to work on the project anyway, determined to make it work somehow. This was when he started collaborating with a fellow French artist named Edouard de la Boule, who had written multiple books about the United States. Both of them were big fans of America and wanted to create some kind of American French monument. La Boule was an anti-slavery activist whose appreciation for America had only grown when the Union defeated the Confederacy. In 1875, La Boule created the Franco-American Union to raise $250,000 in order to finance the statue that Bartholdi had designed. This would be over $7 million in today's money. The idea was that Americans would in turn raise money to create the statue's base or pedestal. In this way, the funding would be split between the two countries. The pedestal of the Statue of Liberty is enormous, and most people who have never seen it in person don't realize that the base is nearly as tall as the statue itself. It turned out to be pretty hard to get people in New York City interested in putting up any real money for the project. New Yorkers just weren't that interested in building a huge statue. In 1876, to try and get some more interest in the project, Bartholdi put the statue's hand and torch on display at the Philadelphia Centennial Exhibition. New Yorkers were still skeptical and asked why he wasn't showing off more parts of the body. Bartholdi began to say that he might just put the Statue of Liberty in Philadelphia instead. This ended up being his best marketing strategy. New Yorkers didn't want to miss out, and so they agreed to exhibit the hand and the torch in Madison Square to advertise the project and attract more money. In the 1880s, the American Committee for the Statue of Liberty created a new strategy for raising money to build the pedestal. They sold small models of the statue. You could buy a 6-inch tall one for a dollar and a foot-high one for five dollars. These were marketed all over the country. This not only raised money, but raised awareness of the statue, since these tiny replicas started popping up all over the country. The statue began to really take hold in the mind of the public. This was the most successful fundraising project, but there were others as well. There were plays, galas, and even boxing matches. Emma Lazarus wrote a famous poem titled The New Colossus that was first read at a fundraising art exhibition in 1883. Later, the poem would be inscribed on a bronze plaque on the inner wall of the statue's base. This poem is where the famous line, Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, comes from. 
It helped to make the statue about more than just democracy. It began to be seen as a symbol for the waves of immigrants arriving in America from Europe in the late 19th century and their hopes for a better life. Joseph Pulitzer, the guy who the Pulitzer Prize is named after, also played a major role in getting the base funded. He was an immigrant himself, having been born in Hungary. Pulitzer was the publisher of a tabloid called The New York World, and he used his influence to raise money. He ran an article in the newspaper urging readers to contribute money to the Statue of Liberty. The article pointed out that the statue itself had already been paid for by the masses of the French people, by the working men, the tradesmen, the shop girls, the artisans, by all, irrespective of class or condition. Since the French had already done their part, it wouldn't be right for Americans to leave them hanging. The article worked. Pulitzer raised $100,000 to complete the project. Most of the money came in the form of donations that were $1 or less. The statue was essentially crowdfunded, although that term certainly didn't exist at the time. It wasn't a fast or easy way to fund the project, but it did give Americans a sense of ownership and connection to the statue. They were the ones who had made it possible after all. Even though the statue was made in France, the American public had made it happen. It was ordinary people, not the extremely wealthy or powerful, who had made the statue a reality. In 1885, the statue finally arrived in New York in 350 separate pieces. It would have been much more difficult to somehow ship it over already assembled. It took a year to actually be put together, partially because the base hadn't actually been finished yet. In October 1886, the statue was finally finished and dedicated. There were 15 straight minutes of applause before President Grover Cleveland delivered a short speech where he said that the statue holds aloft the light which illumines the way to man's enfranchisement. The Statue of Liberty, which is still technically called Liberty Enlightening the World, instantly became a big tourist magnet. There had been a lot of hype surrounding its development, and the consensus was that it had paid off. An obscure piece of legislation called the Private Card Mailing Act also helped garner attention for the statue. It authorized private companies to make postcards for the first time in U.S. history, so long as they met certain size and quality standards. Many visitors to the Statue of Liberty bought postcards with the statue on them, and these postcards quickly spread around the country and the world. These Statue of Liberty postcards became such a profitable business that the people creating them convinced Congress to give them an embargo 11 years later. In 1897, the government banned the importation of postcards depicting the statue and other so-called American scenes from other countries. That way, the postcard companies wouldn't have to deal with any unwanted competition that would drive down prices for consumers. World War I made the statue an even more prominent American symbol. It was one of the last things that U.S. soldiers would see before they sailed off to fight in Europe, and it was one of the first things they would see when they returned home. In 2019, a new $100 million museum for the statue was opened on Liberty Island, which is what the land the statue is on is called today. It was also paid for by private donations, showing that there are still people out there who think the Statue of Liberty is something worth preserving for future generations. For more videos on the most amazing forgotten parts of our history, be sure to subscribe to the Intrigued Mind channel, like the video, and leave your suggestions in the comments below.